welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. Supported by the right-wing elements of Israeli society, Israeli authorities have deported tens of thousands of African asylum seekers as a part of a long-standing plan to rid the country of non-Jewish refugees. According to the Ministry of the Interior, 72% of these African asylum seekers are of Eritrean origin and 20% are Sudanese, some roughly one-third Christians from South Sudan. The vast majority of them have arrived between 2006 and 2012. Israeli government has always maintained that these are economic refugees, therefore not real refugees, in quotes, hence disqualifying them as asylum seekers. Recently, there has been a lot of press about the Israeli government striking a deal with Uganda and Rwanda to accept deported asylum seekers from Israel for $5,000 a head. Rwanda has denied this deal, but multiple sources have confirmed that Israel promised to pay $5,000 to Rwanda or Uganda for each asylum seekers that they accept. Additionally, Israel is also selling weapons to Rwanda and Uganda to seal the deal. Now joining me is Leah Tarachansky. She is a journalist and documentary filmmaker. Along with Jesse Friesen, she co-directed the film Ethnocracy in the Promised Land, Israel's African Refugees. Here's a clip from it. government should send uh, send them back to Africa? Uh, yes, just uh, deploy police, army and take these people to jail. They want to say that Israel is a democracy, but in the end, there is no democracy here. ما في ديمقراطية خالص ده اللي أنا أقدر أقوله أنا عندي سبع سنة ماشي لثمانية سنة في إسرائيل ما حصل شفت ديمقراطية ولا شفت عدالة في أي حاجة They exploit us uh, they allow us to enter to Israel to work in a cheap manpower, in a heavy duty working, like cleaning. After seven years, they use us and they put us in prison. This is a kind of exploitation. Leah, good to have you back on The Real News. Thanks for having me. Leah, let's uh, start off by describing the community of asylum seekers. Who are they? What are they doing in Israel? How long have they been there? And uh, what is happening to them? So African asylum seekers started coming to Israel about a decade ago. Uh, most of them came on foot through the Sinai Desert. Um, uh, that, that process and that journey has been documented to be extremely uh, dangerous. But some of them have also come from other places than Eritrea and Sudan, which is where 85% of the refugees come from. Uh, some of the refugees came from Nigeria and other countries uh, on the west of Africa, but all of them, including uh, the refugees from Cote d'Ivoire have been deported already. Um, the most recent uh, deportations is what we're hearing in the news right now, and that's of refugees that are left over from uh, Eritrea and Sudan. And uh, tell us about um, why they're there, how long they have been asylum, asylum seekers in uh, Israel, and what has been the political circumstances that they are facing in Israel? So African asylum seekers started coming to Israel roughly around 2006. And when they first started coming, most of them on foot through the Sinai Desert, they were actually welcomed and treated uh, humanely. However, Israel, because it's an ethnocracy, meaning that it's not uh, a country where you actually have a process 
for claiming refugee status and having your uh, individual refugee status checked by uh, the UNHCR and the government and so on, um, it basically, uh, because they didn't have a, a path towards permanent residency, they were just left in this stateless situation in the borders of Israel. Uh, but what we're seeing right now is really the triumph of the right, which uh, a few years later started noticing more and more refugees coming and uh, rose up against them. And this wave of rise up by the, the right wing in Israel actually brought to force to power some of the backbench politicians uh, that are now in key positions in government implementing what's going on. And that movement of the far right, the anti-immigration movement, succeeded to get basically uh, no refugees to enter the country anymore. Uh, they led to the deportations of the majority of the refugees. And now we're seeing the end of a long process of making Israel the first developed zero refugee nation on earth. Now, the issue of refugees and asylum seekers is a very sensitive issue in the context of Israel's own history and what the people of Israel uh, and Jews have gone through. Um, give us a sense of how these deportations uh, of asylum seekers are being received among ordinary Israelis. Well, I think that the claim that because Israel is a state that was created out of uh, or immediately following the Holocaust um, makes it somehow uh, more egregious uh, when it deports refugees. I think that that cliche has been kind of circulating and recirculating in the press quite a lot. But I think that the obligation of the state of Israel uh, towards refugees is, is not unique. I think that every developed nation has the responsibility to take care of those that are within its borders. And because Israel doesn't have a process for refugee recognition, that's not possible in Israel. All the other developed nations in one way or another have also been deporting refugees. But the issue with Israel is that unlike other developed nations, the people that come to Israel to claim asylum do not get checked. Their refugee status does not get checked. Instead, what Israel has is a system in which it decides whether a country of origin is deportable or not deportable. And so in one, swell, uh, one swoop, basically, the government decided that uh, Cote d'Ivoire was deportable. And so all the Cote d'Ivoire refugees were deported, uh, or asylum seekers, rather. Um, in 2012, famously, the government of Israel decided that South Sudan was a safe country and deported 1,200 people who came from uh, a place that didn't even exist yet because South Sudan is a new country. They were deported uh, to South Sudan and famously many of them died because South Sudan is, as we now know, in the middle of a civil war and is not safe. Uh, Eritrea and Sudan are the last two countries that Israel has not yet decided are safe and deportable. And that's why we're now seeing what's happening through a system of all kinds of mechanisms, political, physical uh, and legal, getting those last refugees out of the country. Uh, in that way, Israel is now finishing the process uh, of removing all the asylum seekers out of Israel. Leah, where does this put Israel in terms of its international obligations to protect refugees? So is, uh, Israel and Jewish people in general have been the main pushers for the 1951 Convention uh, on the Rights of Refugees, of course, because at that time uh, we were dealing with a, a lot of refugees who were Jewish as a result uh, of the Holocaust. However, after signing the International Convention on the Rights of Refugees, Israel has never respected the rights of refugees. In fact, Israel itself as a country uh, was created uh, at a time uh, and led to the displacement of two-thirds of the Palestinian people, creating the biggest refugee problem in the entire, uh, I in the world, uh, as well as the longest lasting refugee problem, with, uh, to this day, two-thirds of the Palestinian people being refugees as a result of the fact that Israel does not recognize their right to return, again, violating the International Convention on the Right of Refugees. And what we're seeing right now when it comes to Sudanese and Eritrean refugees is actually the state of Israel implementing the exact same policies and practices that it used to implement against Palestinian refugees, the exact same legal tools uh, in order to get these refugees out of the country. Now, uh, Ligel, how are the uh, refugees from Eritrea and Sudan different from 
other uh, groups that are there in Israel, like when you go to Israel, you see a lot of uh, workers from different parts of the world that are there. Do they have a different set of rights protecting them now? I realize they're not refugees or asylum seekers. They're there to work perhaps on work permits. But is there a different system by which they are treated that could be adopted and applied to these refugees? So, because Israel is an ethnocracy, uh, it has a tiered system of rights that are dependent not on the territory, but on the individual's identity. So, for example, if you violate the law in Israel, uh, and you are a Jewish Israeli citizen, it doesn't matter if you violate the law in the West Bank, where Israel officially is not a sovereign, at least uh, officially, uh, whether you violate the law in Tel Aviv or you violate the law anywhere else, because the law is applicable to you as a Jewish citizen of Israel because of who you are. So the, the law in Israel applies based on the actual ethnicity, the blood of the person. So if you are uh, a Jewish citizen of Israel, you are the top of, this, of the tier. If you are a non-Jewish citizen of Israel, such as for example, 20% of the population who are Palestinian citizens, uh, you have slightly less rights and you are discriminated against uh, at, in the very language of at least 30 different laws, um, but you are essentially a citizen and treated uh, as such. But then we have the Palestinians living in East Jerusalem who are not citizens, and then of course the millions of Palestinians in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip that are living under Israeli martial law, and then below them, there's the migrant workers that Israel imports primarily from Asian countries. And below them are the African asylum seekers. And because we have this tiered system, uh, legal system of rights, uh, each of the groups on that, uh, depending on their tier, has access to one or uh, to, to some rights or some privileges. The African refugees don't have access to anything. Uh, when they arrived in Israel, which is something that doesn't happen anymore because Israel built a giant uh, wall uh, on the border with Egypt, essentially cutting off the continent of Africa from Asia for the first time in human history. So no refugees enter the state of Israel anymore. Um, and, but the ones that did were basically dumped in the poorest neighborhoods in Israel. Uh, and that's it. There's no shelters. There's no refugee uh, asylum process. There's no help. They were forbidden from working. And what ended up happening was that most of the African refugees were working illegally or under the table um, to, the, uh, to the point where much of the Israeli uh, metropolitan uh, service industry became dependent on undocumented workers, uh, primarily African refugees, to cook the food in restaurants, to clean the streets and so on. And, and even the, the, the city of Tel Aviv, for example, was employing uh, African undocumented uh, refugees. So, that process led to the fact that they were the most vulnerable population in Israel. And as a result, when the government decided to get rid of all of the asylum seekers in the country, it was able to do so relatively easy. And one of the first things that they did is they built the biggest jail for uh, refugees in the developed world. Um, this is the jail called Hulot, which we document uh, extensively in the film. So what the government basically did is that it built a giant camp in the middle of the desert and then went around and assembled uh, the majority of the refugees uh, or all the refugees that it could and it shoved them into this open air prison basically saying well it's not really a prison it's a camp mm -hmm. and so this is where the refugees were languishing for years uh, imprisoned against their will uh, with no release date and the only option for them to leave that open air prison was to essentially agree to be deported to Rwanda, Uganda, or Kenya, one of three countries with which Israel reached an agreement uh, that they would take Israel's Sudanese and Eritrean refugees in exchange for uh, all kinds of benefits, such as arms, uh, uh, an arms agreement that was reached back then. Now, uh, even if that is the case, it is quite obvious that Israel is in need of uh, workers. They need uh, people to work in the restaurant industry, as you have uh, stated, and and of course in the agriculture sector and in the construction uh, sector and so forth. So why isn't Israeli authorities um, uh, giving them work permits and allowing them to work in Israel uh, without deporting them. Israel has a number of pools of uh, people that it can pull from to fill the positions that the African refugees 
uh, will be leaving as they are being deported, uh, or rather self-deported. For example, uh, tens of thousands of Palestinian refugees in the West Bank come into the territory of Israel uh, and work in, Israeli, uh, in the Israeli economy. They are also unprotected. A lot of them are undocumented. And they are, uh, because the Israeli occupation has collapsed a lot of the Palestinian economy, they need those positions as well. But what we're seeing right now is that, in fact, Israel has created a process in which it's going to uh, remove the remaining 40,000 asylum seekers at a time when it's actually importing a quarter of a million migrant workers, largely from Asia, and allowing the flow of Palestinian uh, workers from the West Bank, even when that flow uh, is undocumented or, as Israel says, illegal. So, for example, Israel claims that uh, the segregation wall that it built on the borders uh, b between the Palestinian and Israeli territories in the West Bank is providing security. But we know that tens of thousands of uh, Palestinian, uh, Palestinian West Bankers come into Israel, some of them undocumented, to work in the Israeli labor market. We know that Israel is importing uh, uh, 250,000 migrant workers from Asia um, in a revolving door policy. Basically, they come, they work for a few years, and then they get deported back to where they came from. And the African refugees were, which are currently being deported are part of that labor force. But because there is an access to an almost endless stream of people who are looking for jobs, even low-paying jobs, even uh, unsecured jobs, even dangerous jobs, it's not worried that the positions that these African refugees are going to be leaving behind are going to be empty. Leah, you clearly stated in this interview that this kind of uh, refugee deportation, uh, asylum seekers deportations, have been going on for a very long time in Israel. This is the end of it, really. Um, yet, if you look at the international media, they're focusing on it now. Why is this happening? I think that What's important to understand is we're now at the very end of a process in which the government of Israel is trying to become the, the developed world's first zero refugee nation. And it's using its own ethnocratic mechanisms to do that. Um, the second thing that I think is incredibly important to understand here is that the way in which Israel is trying to rid itself of all of its asylum seekers is through basic capitalistic arms trade agreements. And uh, because of the success of uh, Palestinian solidarity movements in the, the West, essentially, the government of Israel and its Minister of Economy have been turning to Africa and Asia to try and get countries on those continents to create new trade agreements with the State of Israel. And in one of the delegations, the Prime Minister went with the Mo Minister of, uh, of Defense to uh, three countries, Kenya, Rwanda, uh, and uh, Uganda, back in 2009, 2012, and essentially created the framework through which uh, th we're now seeing that these human beings, these asylum seekers from Eritrea and Sudan, are being sold to third states in exchange for uh, arms, in exchange for various technologies, because those countries, uh, Uganda, uh, Rwanda, and, and Kenya, are now launching their very own security state policies and are needing Israeli arms and homeland security technologies to do so. Uh, and the people who are caught in the middle are African refugees who have zero rights in Israel, who have no process to safety. And what we know from previous populations that Israel has deported, such as the asylum seekers from South Sudan, from Cote d'Ivoire, and from Nigeria, these people end up back on the road and they end up on the preca precarious journey to safety trying to get to Europe. Leah, I understand that an urgent appeal has been made to the Israeli High Court. What are the chances of that succeeding? Um, you know, it has probably a good chance of succeeding, but that's not the point. The Supreme Court uh, has repeatedly, four times in fact, said that the uh, holding refugees indefinitely imprisoned is unconstitutional. The Supreme Court has been clear on the issue of refugees uh, every step of the way, and when it's convenient, the government has ignored its decisions, and when it's not convenient, uh, sorry, when it's inconvenient, the government ignored its decisions, and, and when it is convenient, it said, oh, well, now we have these democratic uh, institutions, and we should follow their, uh, their directives. In fact, the problem that we ended up in now is partially res uh, as a result of the Supreme Court. Yes, the Supreme Court for the fourth time ruled that uh, the open-air prison where refugees were being held is unconstitutional, but it also ruled that this so-called voluntary deportation, or rather giving refugees a few thousand dollars 
to be deported to Rwanda, Uganda, and Kenya is constitutional. And of course, according to the international uh, standards on basic rights of refugees, it's not. In fact, if you look across the, the world in the developed uh, nations, the level of recognition of Eritrean and Sudanese uh, refugees goes upwards of 80%. In the entire history of the state of Israel, less than 200 people got refugee status. And that's only because of political situations here and there. For example, the majority of them uh, were people that came from Vietnam that got uh, a blanket refugee status uh, during the rule of Menachem Begin. So when it's convenient, the government of Israel can respect democratic basic principles, and when it's not, it doesn't. Uh, and what we're seeing right now is actually partially uh, the fault of the Supreme Court, because it's a Supreme Court in a country that is still an ethnocratic country, which means that it's got a different set of laws applied to a different populations based on their ethnicity. And because the African refugees are not Jewish, they don't have access to basic processes of permanent residency or citizenship. Leah, I thank you so much for joining us today, and this has been a very enlightening discussion. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And thank you for joining us here on The Real News Network.